you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Like Sue said, my name is Nicole Fuller. I'm a registered dietitian. I've been um, working in the field of dietetics for almost 25 years now, which <laughs> seems crazy to me. Um, I've worked in various different areas um, of dietetics, long-term care, acute care, dialysis, um, community health programs like this one, um, doing some outpatient work as well. And I love doing programs for the community department where I get to um, do presentations like this one, teaching the community about different areas of nutrition. Um, so today we're going to be talking about intuitive eating, um, which is a great topic. And I'm so interested in this and loving the fact that people want to know more about it. So let's get started. Okay. All right. So I just wanted to kind of briefly go over um, a little introduction about intuitive eating and the outline to, for today, exactly what topics we'll be covering. Um, so if you've experienced guilt, shame, frustration about your body, about um, your weight, how your clothes fit you, know that you're not alone. I think each and every one of us has felt at least one of those things, right? So intuitive eating believes it's time to fight back against diet culture, um, finding the freedom and be able to enjoy food and life. Okay. So we're going to cover what intuitive eating is, um, what health at every size is the principles of intuitive eating, which include 10 basic principles. And then at the end, we'll open it up for any questions or discussions. Okay. So diets don't work. That should be said first and foremost, diets don't work. Um, as you can see here, as you can see here, 95% of all diets fail. Um, usually the weight is regained. And for some people, it's even, it's regained even more within the first five, one to five years. The weight loss industry as of in 2020 was worth $71 billion. This year in 2023, globally, it's expected to reach $278.95 billion. That is a lot of money. We got to ask ourselves who benefits from these diets? Because I don't think that it's us necessarily. It's the people who are selling the th all of the things, okay? Um, more often than not, people who do lose weight from diet dieting will regain that weight. As I said, studies have actually shown that two thirds of the people who have lost weight on a diet regain more that more than they initially lost. So, you know, if you go on a diet and you lose weight and then you gain the weight back and then you go on another diet and then you gain the weight back and then, then some kind of like yo-yo dieting, eventually you're going to just continue to gain weight. So that's why we're saying diets fail. Um, dieting can affect your met metabolism. It can affect your ability to feel hunger and lean into that hunger and fullness, those hunger and fullness cues. And in the end, it's going to make you feel guilty, miserable, and it, it, you're not going to feel good about yourself. Intuitive eating. I actually have the book right here. It's um, you can get it off Amazon if you are interested in in reading it on your own. I'm it is a little bit technical and it is um, over three hundred pages, but it is a very good read. Um, intuitive eating. Just a little bit about it. It was developed in the '90s by you could see here Evelyn Trebol and Elise Resch. That um, I think one of them is at least a dietitian. Oh, they're both dietitians. Um, it, you know, it's not the same information in it as 1995. They've done many updates. The one that is most recent was in 2020, um, that you can also get an intuitive eating workbook, um, that they released in 2017. And I believe you can get that on Amazon as well. Intuitive eating itself has over 125 studies, um, that show the benefits of intuitive eating. Um, intuitive eating honors your health by listening to individual, the individual person and as including their body, mind, emotions, you are the expert of your body. And it's trying to get you to learn that or understand that, um, intuitive eating is a process. There is no failing or, um, you know, being the best at it. 
Um, it, it's a process, a lifelong journey. Okay. No judgment here in the eyes of intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is a non diet approach. Okay. So if you came to the presentation thinking you're going to learn about intuitive eating as a diet, something to make you lose weight. This is a non-dieting approach focused on changing, on changing your eating habits. It's not about choosing healthy foods or anything like that. Again, non-diet approach. It's about trusting your body to make food choices that feel good to you without you judging yourself for it. <clears throat> what are some of the benefits of intuitive eating? I mean, there are more than just what's listed here, but I just wanted to go over intuitive eating has been shown to improve cholesterol levels, to have a better body image for yourself, no matter what size you might be. Um, mo intuitive eaters tend to have a higher self-esteem. Their metabolism seems to be better. Um, decreased rates of disordered eating or emotional eating has been uh, associated with intuitive eaters lowered stress levels, and being more satisfied with life in general. In addition to what I just mentioned about benefits, um, people who are intuitive eaters tend to learn what foods that they truly like and dislike. There's less mental energy spent thinking about food. Um, more energy in general, having more energy, they're less have less cravings. There's a better relationship with food as well as with exercise. And 2D readers tend to have an overall improved mood and, and better digestion. So these are just some of the benefits of going, leaving dieting in the past and moving on towards intuitive eating. Um, along with intuitive eating, I wanted to just put in something about what healthy at every size is, and this is a trademarked name. Um, it is an alternative approach to the weight centered approach to treating patients. Okay. We want to treat everyone the same clients, patients of all sizes. It doesn't matter. It's also a movement working to promote size acceptance at any size. We want to end weight discrimination, um, lessen the cultural obsession with weight loss and thinness, right? Um, th they also call health at every size haze. That's another, um, like a short term haze. It promotes balanced eating, life enhancing physical activity, respect for the diversity of bodies, shapes, and sizes. And while intuitive eating has 10 principles, health at every size has five basic principles. So um, one of them being, and again, Hayes focuses on health rather than weight. Okay. Weight inclusivity is one of the principles and it's about accepting and respecting the difference in body shapes and sizes. There's no ideal specific weight. Okay. We have, that has to go out of our brains, health enhancement, support health policies that improve and equalize access to information, services, personal practice that improve human well-being. Okay, um, respectful care is another principle, and that's working towards ending weight discrimination. Basically, eating for well-being, individualized eating based on hunger, based on fullness, nutritionally needs, and pleasure, rather than any meal plan that's focused strictly around weight. Um, so you're eating for well-being, not on the goal of any weight. Um, life enhancing movement. So you want to support activities that let people of all and any sizes engage in some type of movement that brings you joy. Okay. It's not all about physical activity in the name of losing weight. And intuitive eating is aligned with the Hayes principles. So I just wanted to include that in here. And I just wanted to touch on BMI because it is used quite often. And I'll have people say to me all the time, oh, my BMI is such and such that I'm actually considered overweight or I'm considered obese. I just want to touch on it because BMI was developed over 200 years ago by a, a mathematician, okay? He was not a doctor, not a health professional. And when it was developed over 200 years ago, it was never really meant to be used as an indicator of health. Um, it was created to help 
assess population trends, not health status. Again, not to be used as an indicator of health. Although nowadays, that's what it seemed to be used at. Um, BMI does not take into consideration your age, your gender, your race, your fitness level, or muscle mass. And something of note here is that being overweight or being labeled obese does not automatically mean someone is unhealthy. BMI also completely ignores behaviors like what you're eating, whether it's fruits, vegetables, doesn't take into physical activity, how you're sleeping or stress levels. Um, there have been several studies done on BMI that have found many problems with it being used. Um, one research team, I believe it was UCLA, um, found that 54 million Americans were misdiagnosed as being obese or overweight using the BMI. But when looking at metabolic indicators, these people were actually considered healthy. So again, BMI, if you're labeled overweight or obese, it does not, it should not be associated automatically as being unhealthy. So intuitive eating, as I mentioned, there are 10 principles of intuitive eating, and it's, it's basically what it's developed around. Um, the and we were, are going to go over each of these principles. One is to reject diet mentality, um, honoring your hunger, feeling your fullness, making peace with food, challenging the food police, those good, bad foods, um, discovering satisfaction, um, coping with your emotions with kindness, respecting your body, um, movement like physical activity, and honoring your health with gentle nutrition. So those are the 10 basic principles. So first up, we are going to reject diet mentality. Mentality. We want to let go of diet rules, let go of diet restrictions. Um, those are very prevalent in our culture all around. Um, put down all the diet books, go into your email inbox, unsubscribe from any emails that you get about weight, or if you get magazines that are all about diet culture, unsubscribe from that, unfollow. If you're on Instagram, TikTok, any of the social media platforms that you're on, unfollow people that make you feel bad about yourself that are so focused on dieting, okay? Explore your history with dieting. Did it, did what you did in the past work for you? You know, what has dieting cost you? Not even just financially, maybe emotionally, physically, what has it uh, cost you? What can you choose from today at the end of this presentation to let go of today? You know, be curious, be, be non-judgmental. So an example of rejecting the diet mentality would uh, be like, if you see an ad telling you that such and such a food is fattening, you realize now that this is part of a diet culture and you can still continue to eat this food. So maybe at the end of today, you see an ad and it tells you that um, X, Y, and Z food is bad. But tonight you go and eat that food and you don't feel guilty about it. You feel, you realize now it's a part of diet culture, but you continue to eat the food, okay? Start to really pay attention and start to recognize when you're being influenced by diet culture. You're gonna start to see just how many ads there are even on TV. I mean, in my head, I could hear the Ozempic, Ozempic jingle um, going on. Um, you're going to see how inundated with diet ads every single day in and out of your life. Um, so two and three are honoring your hunger and feeling your fullness. Okay. We want to have everyone establish trust. Okay to be able to reconnect to your hunger cues, honor your hunger, okay? You wanna consume overall adequate energy and, car and carbohydrates, okay? Discovering the sweet spot of feeling physically satisfied, okay? Physically satisfied without feeling overly stuffed, okay? Practice some mindful eating, observe the subtle signs that your body is beginning to feel full, okay? Some questions to ask yourself, where do you feel hung hunger in your body? How does your mood shift when you're hungry, right? Do you feel your fullness or are you past the point where you've eaten so much that you can't 
you're beyond full, full. And do you listen to those in, internal cues? Um, are you eating while distracted? If you don't honor your hunger and you're basic when you're and you just don't eat when you're feeling hungry because somebody told you you should drink a glass of water if you're feeling hungry because you shouldn't eat until noon and you so you go with that, you're likely going to just end up overeating in the long run, okay? If you're not honoring your hunger. Um, think about the times that you know you're not honoring your hunger and you reach that point when you're almost beyond feeling hungry. Those are the times when conscious eating goes out the window and, and the overeating takes over. Okay. So you want to learn to honor your hunger and not avoid it. I, I hear sometimes people say, you know, they don't eat in the morning. They'll drink a cup of coffee to try and like put off eating food. That's not honoring your hunger. Um, so here I wanted to put up the hunger fullness scale. You could see here, it's a scale from zero to 10, zero being painfully hungry, 10 being painfully full. I think every, each and every one of us has probably experienced each end of the scale, right? Where we want to be is in the three to seven range. Okay. We never want to get below the three where you're very hungry, almost painfully hungry. When that's when you get to that point where you tend to overeat. You're you're not listening. You didn't listen to your hunger cues. Then you eat so much you are you can't even pay attention to your fullness cues because you're that starving. We want to start to notice our hunger, and then as we're eating, paying attention, listening to our bodies. You know don't eat with distraction. And we start to notice our fullness because, you know, by the time you get to eight, nine, 10, you're, it's like, it's kind of like Thanksgiving. Think about Thanksgiving. You're vowing, you're never going to eat that much again. Okay. You need to trust that you will give yourself the foods that you desire and that you'll know when you are feeling full from it. You, okay. You just have to start to listen to your body to signal that you are no longer hungry start to listen to the signs that you're comfortably full. Take a break with, from when you're eating and say, hmm, how does this taste? Am I, where am I on my hunger scale? You know, this takes practice. I don't think that, you know, after tonight, you're going to be able to eat and realize where you are on the scale all the time. This is definitely a learning curve, but start to pay attention when you're eating, how you're feeling. Another thing we want to do is Principle number four, we want to make peace with food, okay? Give yourself permission to enjoy food, any food, all the food. Um, an all or nothing mentality with food can lead to more cravings and binges because you're restricting so much. I see this all the time. Somebody told me I have cookies in my house. And I spend all day thinking about those cookies and how I'm not going to eat the cookies. And then when they go, they end up eating all the cookies. So make peace with food, eat the cookies, you know, maybe at first when you give yourself permission, you know, to enjoy the food, maybe you will overeat, but at some point you'll realize that eating one, two, three cookies is enough. Okay. Um, we want to remove the excitement from food and normalize it. Okay. Choose a food, decide when you're going to eat it and the environment that you're going to eat it in and enjoy it, okay? You could check in with yourself before, and during, and after while you're eating. How are you feeling as you're eating it? You know, some people, when they're making peace with food and they're eating things that they didn't let themselves eat because maybe they thought it was not healthy or you might start, the guilt might feel there. You might feel a little anxious, Okay. But as you're eating it, think about the food that you're eating. What does it taste like? What are the textures? You know, maybe you'll start to enjoy what you're eating a little bit. Okay. You can maybe take notes if you want to. How, how is the experience when you just let yourself eat the food? And following that, making peace with food is challenging the food, food police. Okay. Um, we want to come Front that bully that's in our mind that's telling you or telling your food choice this is a good food this is a bad food or healthy and unhealthy there we want to ditch morality in food choices okay begin to look at food from a place of self-care 
we really, there is really no good or bad food or healthy or unhealthy. There is food that is more nutritious and provides us with more nutrients, you know, that our bodies need, but the other food is still food too. It's just not as nutritious. Okay. Making observations, not judgments. Okay. We got to, you have to change your, your self-talk, the language. Okay. Um, immediately got to get rid of the good and bad. Maybe start talking positively to yourself, positive affirmations, especially around food. There will be ups and downs for sure. Again, this is um, a lifelong journey. I don't expect anyone at the end of today be able to automatically think, okay, if I've thought of pizza as being a bad food or ice cream as being a bad food, all of a sudden I'm going to turn around and not have those that in my head. It's a, a journey. It's a process. You have to start to trust your body with food. Um, what are some food rules? Do you like count anything, whether it's calories, um, macros, uh, points, carbs, those are considered some food rules. And we kind we want to get away from food rules. Um, what about serving sizes? Do people, you know, around you talk about serving sizes, portion sizes? Um, do you have, or is one of your food rules based around time? What time of day you, you can eat? If you are doing intermittent fasting, can you eat only at certain times? Are there certain food groups that you avoid? These are some things that you want to talk about and maybe even go and write down food rules you have for yourself that we want to get rid of. That's the point. We want to abolish food rules. Or do you have food rules around beverages? Maybe you say, oh, I can never have um, iced tea or juice or any of those things because of X, Y, Z. They're not healthy. It has sugar. We, Again, getting, I'm just trying to have you think of some food rules you might have in your head or in your mind or that you live by, and we want to get rid of them. Okay. Do you measure weigh your foods? That's also something that when we're talking about changing our um, way of eating to intuitive eating, we don't weigh measure. It's not about that at all. Another thing here, actually a common one, are there any food groups that you avoid? That's a big one because nowadays there are so many people doing some kind of low carbohydrate diet. So what would a food group that you would be avoiding foods that are high in carbohydrate? Again, this is some, something that we want to leave in the past. Next up, number six is discovering the satisfaction factor. Okay. Enjoying food can and should be a part of a healthy eating pattern, no matter what, okay? So when you feel satisfied with your food choices, you're also less likely to overeat and attempt to fill up. So um, it, it, if you're really enjoying what you're eating, like you're gonna tend not to overeat it if you're, I hate to say the word, allowing yourself to eat it, but you'll you enjoy it and you're likely gonna just stop eating it when you feel full. Um, when you're denying yourself what you want is when it results when eating more and enjoying enjoying it less. Okay. So the more you avoid certain food groups, the more likely when you get to it, you're going to overeat it and be more upset with yourself. You're going to have that negative self-talk. Okay. You want to experience the taste, the texture, the smell, all everything. Okay. We also, we often forget about the pleasure and satisfaction that can be had when we are eating. And we really want to go back to that. Um, cope with emotions with kindness. Um, so food is quite often used as a coping mechanism. I have patients, clients all the time using food in this way. Um, but it, it may not help you truly uncover your emotional concerns or what is going on. Okay. And by turning to food, often other things pop up. You're going to feel guilty, feel shameful. Um, so turning to food is not always the best way. Okay. Ask yourself, what do I need right now? Um, I have listed here some things that you could turn to rather than food. And 
some of these things you might not be interested in, but think of other things that you could add to this list. One is distraction, changing your environment, go for a walk. If you have pets, play with your pets or take your dog for a walk. If you have a dog, a dog watching a video or a movie or a TV show, if it, time allows, putting on some music, listening to a podcast. I should have written that because I often do that. Um, so looking for support, whether it's calling a friend or family member, or if you have um, a therapist, making an appointment with a the therapist, or if you um, talking, speaking to with a spiritual advisor might be the way that you want to deal with it. Okay. Journaling. Um, you could even, um, yeah, doing a food, food journal, sitting down, writing about your feelings. Um, that's a great way instead of turning to food. Okay. Um, exercise, walking, taking a nap, maybe you're tired. Okay. And number eight, respecting your body. I love this. We never judge a laboratory for not looking like a greyhound, right? So respect your body. We wouldn't expect a lab to look like a greyhound or a Great Dane to look like a poodle. We we definitely should not have unrealistic expectations and criticisms about our own bodies or our shapes or our sizes, okay? Respecting your body is about learning to take care of and respect your body, regardless of what size it looks like. Listen, if you if your shoe size is a size nine, you wouldn't realistically expect that you could squeeze your foot into a size six shoe, okay? So we have to, no matter what shape size we're at, we have to love our bodies for where they are at right now. Maybe think about, oh, you know, things that you're grateful for right now, even if you're not happy at your shape and size. I can still walk. I can still breathe. I could still do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, going on with respecting your body, look at the cactuses or the plants. No wrong way to have a body. We're all, all unique and different and it's all beautiful. Okay. Get rid of your scale. Get rid of the clothes that don't fit that you're going to try and fit into a year from now. We clothes are meant to fit us. We are not meant to fit the clothes. Okay. Um, you know, look at people with social media. Now you can look for, um, people to follow that reflect your body representation. Okay. Every body, every shape and size counts. Okay. Health at every size movement, feeling the difference. This is principle number nine. So we want to shift away from external cues about how fitness and exercise, about fitness and exercise and see how movement feels inside your body. Okay. Consider how movement affects your sleep, how it affects your energy levels and your stress levels, not focusing on, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z for exercise so that I can lose weight or fit into this or, you know, that, um, we want to look at movement as being enjoy in it, it as enjoying it. Okay. Movement that considers the following rejuvenating rather than depleting, enhancing the mind body connection, alleviating stress. Okay. We want enjoyment and pleasure out of exercise or physical movement. Um, things to ask yourself when you're exercising, how does it feel? How does it feel for you? If you don't like what you're doing, then you should absolutely not be doing it. Um, would you still be doing the exercise if your weight didn't change? Even Maybe you enjoy doing something, but you're not going to lose weight doing it. That is still okay. Are there health benefits? Is it fun? Do I enjoy it? Those are very important questions. Am I, do I, am I comfortable? Do I feel like I need to rest? Rest days are also very important. And the last principle for intuitive eating is honor your health, gentle nutrition. You see how this whole time we have not talked about what food groups to choose from or portion sizes, because it's not about that. Okay. Intuitive eating, it doesn't ignore nutrition, but instead focuses on the big picture health. Um, think about progress, not perfection. How does food feel in your body? What foods or meals leaves you feeling satisfied, feel, feel, makes you feel nourished, makes you feel happy, energized, strong, 
Okay, it's a learning process. It takes a long time. It could take, you know, years and years and years. Okay. Um, gentle nutrition comes down to recognizing that we can trust our own bodies beyond just what our taste buds are craving. Eventually, some people who turn to intuitive eating gain weight. You might think, oh, if I do intuitive eating, I'll lose weight. Some people end up gaining weight and that is okay. After a while, maybe it's because you haven't let yourself enjoy food the way you wanted to. So you're eating things that you thought were bad. So you gain some weight. Eventually, all those foods just become food again, if that makes sense. I did want to put up a slide that shows some additional resources, um, podcasts, if you want to learn more about intuitive eating. Again, it is a 300 plus page book that even has a workbook. So this was just the basics about it. Um, again, you can get the workbook and the book on Amazon. Um, Health at Every Size was also a book and it was written by um, Linda Bacon. Um, the Anti-Diet by Christy Harrison, Body Kindness. That is another great book written by a dietitian. You can get that on Amazon. It's, it's shorter, but it's great. Um, Gentle Nutrition by Rachel Hartley. Anyway, these are just some of the things that you can look into if you um, want to learn more about it. And if you're on social media, you can always search up the hashtag intuitive eating official. And with that, I'm going to open it up with any questions or anything you might want to add to the presentation. And I thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, this is a different approach to say nutrition. Um, and it you know involves mental well-being and emotional well-being, mm -hmm. which you know can correlate with you know lesser lesser stress levels, and who knows that that can mm -hmm. help us. Uh, with metabolism and a lot of things. So if you're thinking it from a physical standpoint, maybe that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's um, it's very interesting. Um, just a couple, just a question about a health-related issue. Um, would you think that this approach might be helpful for managing IBS symptoms in any way? Is there any, or is there any health-related advantages to this type of eating? Well, like we talked about, um, let me go back to the slide. The benefits, like you can see here, improved cholesterol levels. Um, mm -hmm. oh, where was, the, I also had, a, oh yeah. Even in this book, um, intuitive eaters have, you know, lower triglycerides, um, less, they have, um, higher HDL, which is the good cholesterol. Um, they have, you know, lower incidence of disordered eating. They have better improved cholesterol levels overall. Um, when it comes to IBS, I, I think maybe you, that would be having a meeting with a diet. I, I think intuitive eating would work. It's just about what foods you can and can't tolerate related to your IBS. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody's asking about how does this help a vegan or pre-diabetic or vegan diabetic kind of around the same, yeah. How would I think it works? It works for, it works for everyone. I'm not an intuitive eating counselor, so I'm not certified in, in, as an intuitive eating practitioner. I know a little bit about the principles, but finding out if it would work in your lifestyle or are you, it, it depends on how you're looking to use it uh, for. Right. Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions about, you know, emotional eating, binge eating, um, and, you know, physicians encouraging one to lose weight. Well, that's a big thing. It, right. Like health at every size talks about how people don't go to the doctor because uh -huh. they are scared because that's the first thing a doctor says, and it's trying, it's all weight determination and weight stigma and how you have the right to go to the doctor's office and not ask to be weighed. Mm -hmm. um, because weight is not a predictor necessarily of health status. Um, there are studies that were done, uh, people who have um, 
cardiac surgeries, a lot, um, some people with higher BMIs actually respond better to the surgery than people with lower BMIs. Um, I don't know the mechanism behind that, but mm-hmm. weight isn't an, an overall predictor of health status. It's just, and it's getting away from that stigma. Um, we are too weight centric in this country. I mean, I'm sure other countries are too, but it's not all about weight, which is, I think, how we've gotten into this issue of mess, mess, <laughs> like good food, bad food, healthy, not healthy, and yo-yo dieting. And this food, this book is geared towards more taking back control in your life of, of food. Right. Like battling something. Yes. Like chronic kidney disease using this approach. Um, I mean, there are definitely illnesses mm-hmm. and, they don't, and they don't, from what I understand, I, I haven't gotten into the book completely. I, I mean, I don't think they talk about different illnesses within the book. I think it's meant to get away from dieting, but if you have a chronic disease that like chronic kidney disease, you're on dialysis, let's say, there are still foods you're not, you should avoid, but that's a totally different subject. Right. Right. Like, yeah, that's it. When you have those types of illnesses, this is something that needs better attention, you know, different type of attention. Mm -hmm. I think you can still be an intuitive eater, but with the foods that you not, I don't want to say aloud, but I know with, you know, like you should still avoid high potassium foods if you're on dialysis, let's say. Right. I'm trying to see if they have anything related specifically to diabetes in here. Somebody was asking, well, then how do I handle my craving for carbs? Those cravings using this approach and well, you would probably have to work with an intuitive eating counselor. Mm. So this is just an, an overview of how it works. It works, mm. but you, it's it, with that, it's, it's about letting yourself eat the foods you want to eat. Right. It's not about it, it. It's, it's also about working with your mind and one presentation, 30 minutes on intuitive eating is not going to give you the tools you need to go on and be an intuitive eater. It's giving you an idea of what it's based on, but getting the book and maybe the workbook yourself will get you there. Well, I think too, if I can address this, how do I handle my craving for carbs? You know, that one slide um, that you showed about um, knowing your hunger cues. Right. Really focusing on that um, can be very, applicable to something like a craving right like you know, in writing and journaling is something that is is quite suggested i know with intuitive eating is instead of just grabbing for something kind of like a mindful eating take think of the pause or a, take a deep breath and then write down what's going on in that moment right are you really craving carbs at that moment or have you I mean, car, we're allowed to eat carbs. We, mm-hmm. we, we need carbohydrates. Our brains function best on glucose, which comes from carbohydrates. So I think we're so, hear so much about not eating carbohydrates that, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, you have to really take a step back and, and it's like peeling, you know, layers of an onion, you know, we have to let go of those food rules. Mm. Yeah. Like even somebody's asking, so what do I eat then? And then we're so used to that. We're so used to this. This, this is what you eat. This is what you don't eat. And it's, it's not about, stuff. we're addicted to it. You know, that this, kind is, of- this is not about what you telling you, you mm-hmm. should eat five fruits and vegetables and you should, we all know what foods provide us with more nutrition, right? We all know foods that have lots of vitamins, minerals, protein, healthy fats, all that stuff. But it's not about that. It's about honoring your hunger, getting rid of the diet mentality, um, Mm. eating what feels good for you at that moment. And I think that people are scared to let go and trust 
that are going to do that. Like think about children, you know, I'm always, you know, when I see my kids eat, say we go to an ice cream shop and, and they get ice cream and they stop when they're full. I think most adults just eat all the ice cream until it's empty because we're, it's like, oh, wow, I'm going to let myself eat the ice cream. Kids stop, you know, eat when they're hungry and stop when they're full or they don't want to eat it anymore. I think it's kind of like thinking it about it like that. Well, in the diet mentality, if you have something really good, quote unquote, good versus bad ice cream, right? Yeah. That's something that is bad maybe, but a lot right. of times we feel like we're never going to get it again. <laughs> you know, this is, is this going to be my last meal? I better right. enjoy it. Um, or, you know, just, yeah. Right. It, just sort of, uh, yeah, this is not, so it doesn't really talk about food necessarily intuitive eating as to like what we should be eating. It's about listening and honoring what our bodies want. And that, yeah, that's why some people gain weight when they go to intuitive eating. And it's also about body acceptance mm -hmm. and accepting your body for what it is right now. And maybe it means that it's 50 pounds more than you would like it to be. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. Somebody, and this is something very relatable. Someone said, you know, I I've been battling my weight my whole life, 71 lost 87 pounds on Weight Watchers. My husband passed away in April. I'm so sorry. And I've gained 14 pounds back. Uh, I'm therefore in the weight loss mode again, want to lose a hundred, but I can't give up the diet mentality now, maybe in the future. Am I wrong in thinking this way? And um, it's understandable, right? Right. It is on, you know, you have to do what feels good for you. You know, I think for a lot of people, it's hard to give up the diet mentality. I, I mean, it is extremely hard because we're again, inundated from every area tv ads you know side um oh god billboards you know um anywhere you're on social media on the on the computer on the internet anywhere everything is about weight thin beauty stand all of it so it's very hard to give it up right right a lot of people in north america are obsessed because or obese, sorry, <laughs> are obese, and we're obsessed, are obese because of lack of self-control. Why is it right to eat according to your intuition? I mean, I don't know that it's, we're obese because we don't have self-control. I think, I think the whole diet industry is why we are where we're at, because we've been told that being thin is is healthy and that's mm. what they're saying that's not necessarily the case being being overweight or you know not qualified being um labeled overweight or obese does not inherently mean unhealthy um i think people are always dieting because it's always in our face mm. I blame a lot of it on the diet industry. Mm -hmm. Well, why is it right to eat according to your intuition? As I believe, as you practice this type of thing or mindful eating, which is similar, and maybe you need help to do so via coach, um, your intuition, because something you can trust. Right. And, and I think at some point it's not saying go out and just right. eat, eat McDonald's or or pizza whenever you want. It's realizing that at some point you're going to want to eat fruits and vegetables and, mm -hmm. you know, grilled chicken, but that if you have, you know, if you trust, if you're also listening to, oh, I'm going to have pizza, but instead of eating five slices where I'm like full up to here and I'm feeling sick, maybe I'm going to listen to myself and I'll have one slice and mm -hmm. that is satisfying enough. Again, I'm going back to like thinking about children and how they have this inner, they, they have those hunger and fullness cues where they eat when they're hungry. They stop when they're full. I mean, my kids, 
eat junk food, but they also, sometimes my 15 year old grabs a hot pocket and sometimes he uh, grabs a bag of mini carrots. You know, he's right. eating intuitively without even thinking about it because he's not worried about diet, the diet industry and weight. He's just eating what is making him, what he's in the mood for. Does that make sense? It, it, yeah. And it's sort of like our higher selves know better. Right. We know yeah. that, that too much sugar or, or, right. you know, or certain foods make us feel, for instance, you know, for some people having a lot of sugar and, and even white flour makes people more sort of foggy and tired. So listen to that. Know right. thyself, know your body, keep a journal. You know, right. what is it like if you have a cup of coffee before you go to bed? You know, or even have too much wine. What does that do for you? And, and be curious about it. I think that's part of this. Right. You know, um, so yeah, there's just one more comment. And then there's a question about finding a counselor. But um, so someone says, I'm never hungry when I wake up. Should I wait until I get pangs of hunger before preparing food? The problem is my schedule that I may not be in a place when I keep, when I, where, that I can eat, where I um, be in a place where I can eat when the pang hits. Does that make sense? Right. Well, it's about, you know, if you're not hungry when you wake up, it's not about making yourself eat something. It's mm -hmm. just about when you're feeling hungry, you should honor your body and eat because a lot of times when that hunger strikes, you're eventually, you may wait too long and get, remember those hunger fullness cues. If you're getting, you know, we want to be between a three and a seven. If you get below a three, where is that slide? So you can see what I'm talking about. When you get, you know, below a three, um, like when you're very hungry, ravenous, painfully hungry, you're going to tend to overeat, right? So you want to, I would say, have something with you. It might not be a meal, but maybe you could have something on hand that you can quickly eat. Right. Um, I'm writing down something um, about uh, a website about where you might be able to access, you know, find and access a counselor. It's, it's the intuitive eating website. Right, right. <laughs> intuitive eating, they, they have a website with all of their um, credentialed practitioners. Okay, so I'm doing um, via the chat. There it is. It's www.intuitive eating. Sorry, that's one word. Intuitive eating, I-N-T, U-I-T-I-V-E, eating.org. All right, and they may be able to assist you to uh, find out where some coaches are. I believe they have a link at the top of their website. Yeah, and there's a lot of people doing this virtually too, which makes it easier. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be just one area. Well, I this was very interesting. Um, Oh, I, I'm sorry. There's a couple more questions. Um, <laughs> I, do you mind? I don't know if we have a couple of no. minutes. Um, yeah, 251. Um, how do we deal? This is a very good question and very common. How do we eat with the clean your plate mentality that many of us has been raised with? People okay. are starving in the world. Clean your plate. That's a great question. That yeah. is a good question. I, I think they talk about it in the book that you. that's one of the things you have to, you have to ditch that mentality. Mm-hmm. If you don't very, very hard, it, easier said than done, right? I know it, it's, you know, I had a grandmother that wh whatever, actually, whatever we didn't finish, it went into the refrigerator, even a glass of milk. If you didn't finish your milk, it went into the refrigerator. So you can save it for later. Right. 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 You know, that's true. That's, that's good. And it's, um, and you're not wasting it. Right. Right. Uh, somebody said, agree, skinny does not mean healthy. Um, so that's a good point. Okay, and I got it. Yep. Yeah. So I think that's it. Thank you so much. This was really interesting and really, really important. And if you could put the slide up, you did the hunger slide, got that. Mm -hmm. Okay. The slide with the book list. Could you put that back up, Nicole? Oh, with the re resources? The resources and re yeah. Yes. And somebody just said, what's wrong with putting less on your plate? And that's a great point. That's a very good point. Yes. 
we are, are a lot of people in America, bigger is better. Think of all the, the especially the chain restaurants and how much they put on your plate. Yep. I went to a restaurant with my husband. It was a while ago, but I'll never forget. They put less on our plate. Now, we were satisfied, but he complained about that. Oh my gosh, look at these portions. I'm like, that's healthy. So that's something we need to shift again. It's a lot of shifts of mindset, right? Yes, exactly. And one of the books listed on here, Body Kindness, is also a really good mm -hmm. book. Very good. Yes. Okay, everyone, we're going to sign off. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Nicole. That was wonderful.